When I look out over the council grounds at Red Lake, I sense the spirits of my many brothers and sisters, the Cherokee people, who made their camps here so long ago. A quiet commotion can be heard across the fields and among the trees. The noise of many people coming and going. Children laughing, families and clans gathered in small clusters. Deep blue springs of water bubble up as women fill earthen jars. The wind clips the trees, leaves shake and sway. I smell the smoke of hundreds of campfires. Meat is roasted. The smell of tobacco floats across the breeze. I see clusters of men they seem to talk to the events of the day. I can still feel the anguish of the choices that had been forced upon them. The air is still full of frustration, uncertainty. So much endless talk, so many broken promises. <laughs> The story of these seemingly peaceful fields and meadows and what they held for the Cherokee people is one worth telling and retelling. They were soon to be exiled to a place far away from where their music, singing, and dancing could no longer be heard, from where the warmth of their council fires could no longer be felt, leaving these council grounds at red clay, unoccupied, quiet, and empty. Yet, in spite of forcible removal to distant lands far to the west, the Cherokee will say together, today with one voice, We, we are still here. During the 18th century, uh, the Cherokee people inhabited land over parts of what are now current day North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. They also claim parts of what is now Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia as hunting grounds. By the time of our removal, the Cherokees had ceded 90% of their land. We only had about 8 million acres left of our original 80 million acres. So over 50% of it is actually gone before the United States ever comes into existence. And then there's just a slow continuation of continual sessions of land for various economic and political reasons. Within a century, their land holdings had shrunk to a point where the Cherokee Nation was roughly located in the corners of four southern states. By the 1800s, New Echota in northern Georgia became their capital, named after an earlier ancient Cherokee town. Here they lived as a nation within a nation. Cherokee had prospered and developed into successful farmers, planters, and businessmen. Many had converted to Christianity. One of the things that the Cherokees are, are best renowned for is for the development of written language. And the genius Sequoia, of course, had developed this in the early 1820s. First, they could uh, begin their educational systems, which they did. The first newspaper came out, the Cherokee Phoenix. The picture at the top shows a phoenix rising up out of the flame. And that's very symbolic to the Cherokee because of the fact that that represented what the Cherokee had been going through. The Cherokee Phoenix is the first Indian paper produced by an Indian nation in its own language. It is bilingual, so it is a portion of it is in the English language um, for building collaborations and for generating networks of political support among Americans in the North. In 1828, gold was discovered in present Dahlonega, Georgia, and so that 
increased the Georgians' desire to extinguish the title of Cherokee lands because the gold was all on Cherokee lands. Georgia soon declared the laws of the Cherokee null and void. Treaties were ignored. Many called for removal. Georgians started to move into Indian territories while Cherokee properties were sold off in a series of land lotteries. There's countless tales of Cherokees recounting how white people came and beat them and robbed them and they were locked up in jail. The Cherokee Nation was overrun by these people and by 1833 they had, were selling maps. They had mapped out the Cherokee Nation so you could see exactly where, what creek, what road, how you could get to your improvements and go and dispossess the Cherokees. New calls for removal kept increasing. The strongest challenge came from none other than the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson. Even though he claimed to be an ally, he proved to be no friend of the Cherokee people. President Jackson's popularity and election for presidency in 1828 were largely attributed to his pro-Indian removal platform. To my brothers, the Cherokee circumstances that cannot be controlled and which are beyond the reach of human laws, render it impossible that you could flourish in the midst of a civilized community. The new laws prohibited them from testifying in court, mining for gold, conducting any kind of tribal business or even meeting together in groups. Looking for a new place to meet, Cherokee leaders chose red clay on the edge of the Tennessee-Georgia border as a place to hold tribal councils beginning in 1832. Most of the council meetings at Red Clay, the primary issue was Cherokee removal. And it was held at Red Clay because we couldn't, our government couldn't function in Georgia. Such was the persecution. Tennessee, not nearly that bad. Uh, there would be thousands, there would be throngs of people around. We have records from councils in 1837 that indicate many, many thousands of people there for days, um, that their camps were through the open woods stretching for miles. There were thousands upon thousands of Cherokee Indian people that came to these council meetings. They listened very attentively they were very much interested in what was going on. Their behavior was very, very good. Just amazing. There are almost these um, sort of competing currents of great anxiety, but also of great uh, socialness uh, that are taking place at Red Clay. Newly elected tribal leader John Ross held a large estate only 20 or so miles west of Red Clay. While only one-eighth Cherokee on his mother's side, he was chosen because of his financial and political influence and command of the English language. Ross helped draft a Cherokee constitution in 1827. This document was patterned after that of the United States of America and would revolutionize Cherokee government and legislation. He had been selected um, and kept in his position by Cherokee people because they judged him the person uh, most able to deal with the Americans. He ultimately had the support of Major Ridge thrown behind him uh, because Ridge, in a very self-sacrificing way, thought that Ross was exactly the kind of leader that the Cherokee Nation needed for the future. So Ridge really sort of put a cap on his own career in order that Ra Ross could move to the forefront. Early in the course of the Red Clay Councils, two distinct groups emerged. The first group was led by Ross and was known as the National Party. They made up a majority of the citizens of the Cherokee Nation. A second group had risen in the meantime, comprising only a minority of Cherokee, known as the Treaty Party, Major Ridge, his son John Ridge, John Ross's brother Andrew, and Elias Boudinot led this group. Major Ridge, um, had grown up during the time of the uh, uh, frontier wars with the Americans. He'd been active in that. He was an old warrior. He was a respected headman. The respect that he was given 
was given to him as a Cherokee leader. Vague outlines begin to take shape in the late evening light. Two distinct groups silently file into the great council house at Red Clay. Once again, they come to debate the two great questions. Remain here on lands that we, the original people, the Cherokee, have occupied since the beginning? Or take the offer given from distant leaders in Washington to remove to the lands of the West? Brothers, we wish to remain on our land and hold it fast. We appeal to our Father, the President of the United States, to do us justice. We look to him for protection in the hour of our distress. Ross had been busy in Washington. He found support in people like Senators Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, as well as Congressman Davy Crockett. The Supreme Court sided with the Cherokee Nation in the landmark Worcester versus Georgia ruling. This legislation served as a foundation of the principle of tribal sovereignty. Many thought, at last, this action would block Jackson's plan. They were wrong. Andrew Jackson was well known to the Cherokees uh, already by the time he becomes president in 1828. Their earlier contacts with him in particular had been in the, the War of 1812 and the war with the Southern tribes. And Jackson had already attempted to double-cross the Cherokees. The Supreme Court rulings uh, that went in favor of the Cherokees, they saw as the federal government stepping in. The next measure that should be taken is that the U.S. should enforce its prior treaties. And Jackson refused to do that. You have but one remedy within your reach, and that is to remove to the West and join your countrymen who are already established there. And the sooner you do this, the sooner you will commence your career of improvement and prosperity. And let the Supreme Court enforce their law. Then he declared there would be a council meeting at New Ashoda in December of 1835, and that if anyone did not attend, they were considered to be in favor of the treaty. Soon after, in December, some 500 Cherokee traveled to Georgia to meet with government agents sent by President Jackson. They were to reconsider the terms of a new treaty that had been submitted. Ironically, Ross was in Washington, D.C. at the time to try to negotiate directly with the president. Back in New Echota, Major Ridge felt compelled to sign. Major Ridge said, we can't survive as a nation here. We're not safe. I don't want to leave the graves of our fathers. None of us do, but it's an ironclad necessity. We can't resist with force. If we do, we'll all be killed and our kids too. To preserve the Cherokee Nation, we have to go west of the Great Waters. When Major Ridge signed the Treaty of New Echota, he was reported to have said that he was signing his own death warrant, which he did. Ridge and those who had signed the treaty argued that the only hope for survival was to give in to the government's demands. Ross's reaction to the signing of the treaty, however, was totally different. We are denationalized. We are disenfranchised. Our hearts are sickened. Our utterances paralyzed when we reflect on the condition in which we are placed. The last council never convened. Instead, troops moved in and the military removal began in May of 1838. Over 16,000 Cherokee were rounded up and marched west. The Trail of Tears had begun.
The meadows and the fields are as green as ever at the council grounds at Red Clay. Trees sway in the breeze. Birds are singing. The blue spring still flows. The fires of that last council meeting still burn as an eternal memorial to the events that took place here almost 200 years ago. Over the course of those six long years and after 11 spirited council meetings, my people were removed to the territories of the West. We suffered the pain of a forced journey. We mourned those who died along the way. But we endured, we rebuilt. We kept the spirit of the seven clans alive in the hearts of our children and our grandchildren. My people, the original people, the Cherokee, resisted, persisted, persevered. We are still here. <laughs>